I'm going to start with a random thought that occurred to me this morning. It's that if you look at the length of time the planet's been around, and then you look at human civilization, it's a sliver, right? Then you look at the people alive today, right? It's been probably about 400 generations since the dawn of civilization. So the people alive today, you know, we're a sliver of a sliver of a sliver. And that we're presiding over an extraordinary change that's going on today. And I know you probably think I'm going to talk about climate change. That's actually not what I mean, because you already know that. We're also presiding over the introduction for the first time in human history of a period where everything we're doing is being traced. 25 years ago, you know, you didn't, if something, someone said something happened, you didn't have a time machine, you didn't know. Today, Google Maps knows you're here, right? WhatsApp messages and emails you're sending are going out. Everything will be able to be traced by future historians, not through some parchment or scroll. They'll have the WhatsApp message, right? They'll, know every, they'll be watching this video. Hold on to that thought for a second, I'm gonna come back to it. And let me introduce myself. So my name is Tarek Fancy. Uh, my last name is actually Fancy, like the word F-A-N-C-Y. Uh, my middle initial is B, actually, so my name is Tarek B. Fancy, because, <laughs> because my parents have a sense of humor. Um, and uh, I've sort of lived a career at the extremes of purpose and profit. It started on the profit side. I was a tech banker at the end of the dot-com bubble, and then I went into what's called vulture or distressed investing. And I worked for a guy who used to be the chief investment officer of a guy called Carl Icahn. Very aggressive, corporate raider style. And, you know, it's not where I expected to find myself. Got promoted very quickly. And then at some point, I decided to leave entirely and focus on purpose. And it was through the inspiration of a very close friend of mine and roommate who uh, passed away of cancer. But while fighting stage four melanoma, he went and created a charity for education in Kenya. This is a blonde haired blue eyed Dutch guy. And my family actually was from Kenya for generations. And, it was truly inspirational and it caused me to go to the purpose side and I created it uh, and worked for years for no salary to create a, a digital charity called Rumi that now allows kids to learn on smartphones around the world, girls in Afghanistan and so on. Very meaningful work. A few years ago, having been sort of one of the people who lived on both extremes, I was approached by BlackRock to sort of try to combine the two as the first, effort, first ever chief investment officer for sustainable investing. And uh, spoiler alert, uh, it turned out not to be exactly what I expected. I think there was a lot of people working on things that were well-meaning. But in the end, I had enough experience in finance to start to realize that most of what we were expecting to come out of this wasn't going to come. Right? You had a lot of statements and policies, very nice, they're non-binding, words on a page. You had a lot of new products, the vast majority of which, if you understand finance, they're pretty much just moving money around. Right? So they can give different people baskets of greener or browner shares, depending on you know, your personal preferences. And it's been so successful, by the way, as a price segmentation strategy that today in the US there's an anti-ESG movement, right? People want anti-ESG funds. And the simplest way I'll explain it to you is by quoting Michael Jordan. From the 90s, someone asked him, why don't you comment on politics? And he said, Republicans buy sneakers too. <laughs> Turns out Republicans buy ETFs, right? And so we're see you know, what I saw on the inside was the system that wasn't really changing in any meaningful way. It was pretty much just painting itself green. And I think, you know, I remember leaving and I told a friend of mine, I said, it was, it's kind of like giving wheatgrass juice to a cancer patient, right? Like it's well marketed and green, but there's no reason to believe it's going to stop the slow moving cancer. And a lot of the ideas behind it were predicated on this idea that the market will magically fix itself. And so I use a lot of sports analogies. The way I think about competitive markets is that they're like competitive sports. So first of all, there is no such thing as a free market. That's total bullshit. That makes no sense at all. Ask any lawyer, and any market is a collection of rules. You can change those rules, and you'll get different outcomes, right? And they all, they all could be called market outcomes. And so if, in, the, in the game of capitalism, the players are trying to compete for profits, and they're usually locked into that because of legal obligations on how companies work. In sports, you're competing to get points, right? So say it's basketball, you know, you're, you're, within the rules, you're gonna try to score as many points as you can. And most of the narrative we were pushing out was this idea that there was this magical new era where good sportsmanship and playing clean leads to more points, right? Like you, you know, it, it's in their own interest to, be, to play clean as a response to the fact that the game has been dirty for 20 years, in large part because many companies are playing dirty because it scores points, right? There's loopholes they're exploiting. And so the analogy didn't make a lot of sense to me, like why would we rely on good sportsmanship when it hasn't worked for 20 years? Look like wheatgrass juice to a cancer patient, so I decided I didn't want to have anything to do with it. And so I quietly transitioned out. I spent six months, you know, sort of doing it really amicably. We had a going away party. And then something happened, you know, six, nine months after I left, I moved back to my hometown of Toronto and the pandemic hits. 
I'd already started to have this concern. I thought, well, wait a second, this may not be harmless, right? This ESG stuff could actually be harmful if no one else knows it's BS, right? I mean, it's great if I know it and I had the position of trying to, as a trained investor, trying to integrate ESG in the largest pool of assets in the history of capitalism. But if no one else knows that doesn't work, we might put our stock in what I call a convenient fantasy, right? That we can leave everything the way it is, the status quo, and you add more data and disclosure and new funds and suddenly the world corrects itself and there's no sacrifice required. And so I was worried enough about it that I did it. I worked with the university in, in Canada on a study to see how the messages around ESG were affecting public attitudes. First of all, we found that the majority of the public has no idea how the financial system works, right? So they don't really know what helps and what doesn't. And so if you give them decisions with their own funds, they'll try their best, but they're not, they don't really know what creates impact and what doesn't. But the, more, the larger concern I had was that we also found that when you showed people, and this worked in the US, all these messages about like companies are magically gonna become green and discover social purpose and so on, it actually, cause them to be less likely to support government regulation, right? So for example, if you go out to the world and you tell people, listen, the solution to climate change is buy a low carbon ETF and you get to make money and fight climate change at the same time, who the hell is gonna vote for a carbon tax? I mean, if you honestly think about it, we're always gonna take the convenient fantasy. And what this showed me was that it wasn't like giving wheatgrass to a cancer patient. It's like giving wheatgrass juice to a cancer patient and then you realize that they're delaying chemo. And the biggest concern I have is that the, the fallacy in how we talk about climate change today to, is that we talk about it as a collective mistake, right? It was like, oh, we're all messing up and the polar bears are gonna suffer. I don't think that's a particularly good way to galvanize any kind of political constituency into action. A and B, I don't think it's true. What we're really talking about is a shared problem, a collective problem that all of humanity needs to work to solve. And every single day we delay it, we don't just amplify the costs, we transfer them. I mean, the, I'm engaged in a public debate with the CEO of BlackRock, Larry Fink. I've started making the point that, listen, he doesn't respond. And it's kind of grating because what am I relative to Larry? I'm younger, I'm poorer, and I'm darker skinned. Who's gonna lose out from the delay on, on climate change? The youngest, the poorest, and the darkest skinned. So I decided to go public. I started writing papers about it. I, I did what I knew how to do as a, as a brown guy who grew up in a suburb of Toronto that was, you know, not the roughest, but it was kind of, you know, uh, rough around the edges at times. And I said, this is bullshit. I'm going to go pick a fight. Started to try, to try to create a debate. I wrote papers everywhere. I wrote a, 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 a paper that went viral called The Secret Diary of a Sustainable Investor. And the major points around it were that we now know how to flatten a curve. We just did it, right? With COVID-19, there was infections curve and the epidemiologist said, you can't leave this to the free market, right? You gotta close the schools, you gotta restrict travel. You know, it's nice to tell people to wear masks, but you also have to have a mask mandate, otherwise you're not gonna flatten the curve. Funnily enough, economists have been saying for decades and Nobel Prizes have been awarded for saying, we need government regulation also to flatten the emissions curve. And yet that doesn't happen. In fact, what does happen is that, and this is an, an example in the US that blows my mind, Netflix, Boeing, Disney, and BlackRock, for years, they've been putting out ESG statements, right? CSR things, right? All four of those companies also have fought off resolutions from their own shareholders, asking them to disclose their political spending, which, post the Supreme Court decision in 2010 called Citizens United, is effectively traceless and limitless. So if you, if you use the sports analogy, I liken it to like a player comes out and they basically, you know, they're given talking points on, you know, on good sportsmanship after the game. And then someone says, hey, by the way, we heard a rumor you might be paying the rest behind the scenes. And they say, yeah, I don't feel like talking about that. And they leave. <laughs> it's fairly disingenuous. And so today you see the data showing us that the public understands that. One of the craziest statistics is earlier this summer, uh, a study came out that said that if you ask CEOs around the world in the C-suite, if they think their own companies are greenwashing, 58% said yes. The, cr the crazy part, by the way, in the US, it's 68%. Two out of three believe their own company is greenwashing. I suspect that none of them actually say that on stage, right? There's a, there's a gap between PR and what's happening in reality. And the biggest concern I have is that it's not just that it's destroying the public faith in the system, right? 70% of Americans thought the system was rigged before the pandemic. It's also destroying the faith of the young in capitalism. So a really interesting analogy. I'm running this nonprofit room. I created it before I'd even gone back to BlackRock. 
this really cool style of learning that's kind of, we call it meme learning, replacing social media for kids, right? It's actually kind of it's growing super fast in the pandemic. And I did a session with some of the learners who are 90% 29 and under, right? It's, it's the Gen Z that we heard about yesterday who were really angry. And it was really fun. They were really interested in what I was saying because I'm the founder and I'm, you know, I'm talking about climate change. And I give this whole spiel and I say, the system is broken, we need to fix the rules, right? You know, good sportsmanship isn't it, it's time to call on the refs. And so one kid puts up their hand and they say, that's why I've always said capitalism as a system is a waste of time, we need to get rid of it. I thought, huh. And someone else puts up their hand and she says, all corporations lie, right? That's, we all kind of know that. And I thought it's so fascinating that I was trying to tell them that we need to fix the system. They heard we need to jettison the system. Why? Because every single year they see the leaders of that system stand up on stage and say, climate change is the greatest threat to humanity. And every single year they read the latest IPCC report coming out of the UN or other scientist bodies saying we're pretty much getting nothing done. They rationally conclude that this is kind of a heist, right? That you know, this system clearly doesn't work and we need to find a better one to work with. So I think when we look at the work we're doing, all of us, and I think this works across every industry, because the interesting thing about BlackRock is you get advantage of like every industry and how it works, I think is, is, it's a dose of honesty. And I think that dose of honesty has to happen even if it's outside of our personal incentives. Right? It's some, sometimes, I, I talk to people all the time in different industries and they'll say, listen, I work on this initiative that's green, but they're experienced enough to know that it, it will look nice optically but it's not gonna have the desired effect. And I think at a moment in time where we know, future is starting to look back and say, what did these people do when we were at th these tipping points? We cannot be in a situation where we're answering inconvenient truths of convenient fantasies, because I submit to you, we won't make 2050 and figure out if net zero is gonna happen. Long before that, we're gonna see massive political instability because the foundations of the capitalist system will be destroyed and a generation of young people no fault of their own will look at this and say, this system doesn't work and we need to overturn it. So two thoughts before we introduce this panel for this audience. Number one, we're gonna need more clean players, right? This sport needs more clean players. So there's a lot of in people in this room who are leaders. It is more expensive, it is harder, it's gonna be difficult going into a tough economic period, but we're gonna need to provide some examples of how play, play can be clean. And in part, that's for the second reason. So we can go to governments and tell them that, listen, we need regulation. Because number one, individual action is not going to aggregate enough, right? Nice people using paper straws is not going to do it. Right? We need it to be systemic. It has to be everyone. Number two, it can't be voluntary. It has to be mandatory. And I think if we couch that, trying to play clean and leading the way with a very honest message that it's pretty much time to call on the refs because otherwise we're not gonna be able to create the kind of systemic change required, then I think we actually have a chance of turning the tide this decade. Thank you.